and he's recording. Okay, so one of these has got to work. Okay. This Veterans History Project uh, interview is being conducted here at the Niles Main District Library uh, up on the third floor in the boardroom. Uh, today is Monday, October the 22nd in the year 2018. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea and I'm a member of the reference staff and I'm privileged to be speaking with Mr. William Carr. Uh, Mr. Carr was born in 1948 in Chicago. And okay, now actually I was born in, I lived in the suburbs, excuse me, I was born in uh, Berwyn, Illinois. I grew up in Lyons. So I, I live in Chicago now, but, but just to make sure, I was actually born in Berwyn, Illinois. I actually grew up in the suburbs when I was younger. Thank you. So and, um, I just want to make it absolutely clear. And then uh, Mr. Carr learned of the Veterans History Project through attending veterans that meet in Wharton Grove at uh, Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts, yeah. And uh, he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project. And here is his story. Um, Mr. Carr, do you recall when you entered the service? Yeah, I entered in March 1969. And where were you living at that time? Okay, I was living with my parents. Uh, we were living in the suburbs. I lived in Lyons, Illinois. And, uh, and what were you doing uh, at the time you entered the before you entered the service, how was your life at that time? I was just a uh, civilian. I worked in uh, in Cicero. There was a it was called like a printing factory. It was what they call a bindery. We didn't actually print anything. We just did the final work. Uh, one of my brothers well, eventually became a foreman. And after I graduated high school in 1966, he got me a job there. And then I was drafted in March 1969. And then that's when I went in the service. So. Um, what, what high school did you attend? Okay, I went to Morton West High School. I, I lived in Lyons, but I went to school in Berwyn, Illinois, and I yeah. graduated in 1966. Did you expect to be drafted at that time? Or? Yeah, most of my friends and uh, guys that I went to school with, either they had been enlisted or joined the service. I have a brother that's a year and a half older. Uh, he enlisted in the Army in 1966. And he's, he was in for three years, so he, he got out just before I went in. So he'd been in for three years, and when you, at that time, when you were drafted, uh, if you were drafted, you were on active duty for two years. Or you're supposed to be, you were supposed to be at two years, two years uh, in the reserves, and then two years in active reserves. But by that time, when I got out, I actually got out, uh, I was only really in a, just a little over a year and a half, they were, that's when the war was winding down, they were drawing the troops, they were cutting back the services. So if you came back from Vietnam and you had less than six months of service, you could apply for an early discharge. And I, I was going to go back to school. I was planning to go back to school, so I got an early discharge. So I was only in, I like, yeah. I was in. So that, the enlistment option that your brother exercised, that didn't interest, you, you didn't no. consider doing that? he was in for three years. I mean, he, he told me, he said, he regretted that he, that he didn't wait, that he, you know, could have volunteered for the draft or got drafted because he was in for, like, he had to stay in his full three years. So when I was in, I was actually only in about, like, half the time. He so you didn't have to make a decision about what service branch you were interested in or anything. You no. just originally get drafted and then it's... When you're drafted, they, well, usually well, they, the Army was drafting. Uh, sometimes what happens is if uh, somebody was ready to go, like, drafted in the Army, you could volunteer to go in the Marine Corps for two years, but you know most guys didn't want to. They, they figured there was a rougher outfit to go in. So. And um, the fact that you already that your parents already had a son in the service that didn't make any. Effect. Well, they you know they were kind of concerned because the war was still on. But yeah, like and I had an older brother that had been in the after World War II. He was in the occupation army in Germany. So we had, and plus uh, my father. He was, well, he was an immigrant. He, he, uh, he was never in the service, but two of my uncles had been in World War II, so we had, there was a tradition of having military service. Yeah. So what were your first days like in the, uh, in the Army? Well, it was a lot of confusion. I mean, you were, uh, you know, they just tested you, and 
they said you were going to start basic training. I remember the first few days, it seemed like we took all we did, we took a lot of tests. Uh, you know, they wanted to see what kind of, will be, I guess, test your background, your educational level, and then they determine what, you, what, what your job would be or what you would do in the service. So did you, um, were you inducted downtown then? Right, in Chicago, and then we were flown down to uh, Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, and that's where I did basic training. So that was six weeks of basic no, training? No, tra basic training, I think it's actually ten weeks. Ten weeks, and then did you have advanced infantry tra training no, after okay. that? No, okay, what happened after, just when I finished up the uh, basic training, they announced where you would, your next training would be, and there was like myself and maybe four other guys. Uh, we were sent down to Fort Sam Houston in Texas, and I was trained as a medic. And then after I did my training as a medic in uh, Fort Sam Houston, I got to leave. I came back home, and I had over, they had given me orders to go to Vietnam. And then, you know, I, I flew to, well, you go to Oakland, California. You, you wait there for a few days. And then we were flown overseas to Vietnam. Did... Um did the Army have a reason for assigning you to the Medic Corps? Or? They, just, they just told me. They said, uh, you know, I didn't have any background or experience in it. They just, I got orders. There was like several of us. There was like, I think like four, maybe four other guys. And they said, you're going down to, uh, we didn't get a leave. They just said, we're going on a plane. You're going down to Fort St. Houston and uh, it's outside San Antonio. And uh, you start medical training. We, you know, before when they set it up, and then we went through training for ten weeks. And well, how did you how did you feel about being assigned to the medics? Is well, I didn't really have any medical background. It 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 was uh, the only thing is my own opinion. It's just my own opinion, con considering that we were going to be going. You know, we have ended up in Vietnam. I thought they kind of rushed us through the training, and. I mean, there were things they told you, but what you really realize is when you go over there, that's when you, you know, you talk to somebody who's been over there. There are some men, like, like I said, I was just got with the basic training as a medic, but there are more advanced training you can get, but what you have to do is you have to enlist longer time. And I think that there was a place, I think it was in Colorado, I don't know, I can't remember the fort, but if you go there, for like advanced training and it's almost a year, then you have to enlist, you have to stay in the army for another two years. So there there were some, some of the medics were, they did, a, you, like I said, they had good, very good training or like, I don't know if you ever may have interviewed anybody who was a special forces medic, they get very good training, very intensive. It's very difficult. So you weren't afraid of the sight of blood or anything? Or no, you just... They, well, they show you films in that, and you just kind of remember one time we saw a film, and it was they uh, and were amputating a guy's leg, and it was kind of bloody, and s people started kind of like looking away, and the guy it was showing the film says, well, you better get used to that. That's what you're going to see. So, Was that your first time uh, being away from home for a lengthy period of time? Yes, really, it was. I mean, I had gone on trips in it with my family, but uh, yeah. And then you're meeting different people from different right, parts of the country. Right. Was it a little bit of an adjustment, or are you? Well, it was kind of interesting. You meet people from all over, like when you're in the service, you know, you meet people from all over. The, uh, you know, and I grew up in a working class, you know, white area. And then you meet people like, you know, blacks, Hispanics, people from different, re different religions. I had gone to a Catholic elementary school. I went to a public school. But you meet, like I said, you meet people from different backgrounds. And so, yeah, it's... You meet people from when, when you're in the service. You meet people from all over. Yeah. So, were there um, living conditions particularly memorable or stressful? In or? Texas, I'll tell you right now that it was. We were down there. Okay, I went. To, I was in Texas. I think it was June, July, and August. I came home at uh, towards the end of August for my leave. It was very hot down there. I couldn't believe how. Like in Texas, during the day, when we were in training. It would be like a hundred degrees, uh, you know. And at night, it only one time we had the barracks we were in. We lived in an open barracks. And there was somebody had the radio on. It would be nine o'clock at night, and it was still 90 degrees outside. And they didn't, we didn't use any blankets. You just, you know, slept in your underwear. You had maybe a sheet on. It was very, very. We had to be. They were very careful. Uh, 
if anybody passed out in the heat, we didn't really do any uh, a lot of physical exercise or anything. It was it was very. When people say it gets hot in Texas, I believe it. It gets really hot down there during the summer. But if um, if you had been assigned just like the infantry or the automotive repair division or something, you would have accepted that assignment and you could well, just... Well, when you're in the service, you go where they tell you to go. And that's where they told you to go. Yeah, yes. so yeah. they just said, you're a medic, so that's what I became. And um, were there any memorable drill instructors or... Well, when I was in basic training, there were some of the, uh, by that time, there was 1969, some of the drill instructors in it had been in Vietnam. So they would kind of, you know, talk about, you know, what was going on over there. And, you know, so it was kind of interesting to find out what, what they said about the war. But I'll just give you one example. This one, the, his name was Sergeant Walters. He was the, what they called the chief drill instructor. He made a point of always saying, and I had served two tours in Vietnam, and he was over there for two years. And one time he, he, he was saying, he was talking about something, and he said, he used the word buku, buku. He says, oh, that's Vietnamese. It means a lot. Well, I didn't want to correct him. No. I don't know that much French, but actually, that's French. And because of, uh, the French had controlled Vietnam for a long time, when I went over there, they still use some some expressions from the French. So they, they, but I wasn't going to correct them and say no, it's not uh, Vietnamese. Your name was actually a French word. Yeah. So you're so March. Uh, it looks like uh, March twenty fourth. This is when I went in. Nineteen sixty nine. Yeah. And then when do you leave for uh, for Vietnam? Then? Okay, I left in September. I think I landed on September tenth, uh, nineteen sixty nine. So about six months. Right. Uh, after that, yeah. So did you San Francisco, Hawaii, or...? No, I think when we went, if, if I recall, okay, we took off because it's a long flight. It's like almost 20 hours going there. <coughs> it's a little less coming back. <coughs> when we left, I think we went up to Alaska. I think we landed in uh, Okinawa, and then we went into Vietnam. So they, they you know, they land the plane. I guess they refuel or they change the crew or something. But it was a regular, uh, regular civilian aircraft. There were like stewardesses on it. It wasn't a military plane. When I went over it, remember the name of the airline? No, I don't remember. It was a regular airline. Regular airline. And, and okay. it was like stewardesses on there. Yeah. You know, and uh, like some some guys that went over there, like I had, I you know when I talked to the veterans, some of the ones in the first units they sent over there, they were sent over on ship, and with all their equipment in there. But see, by the time I, they had been pretty, the war, you know, they had been established for a while. So you, when you went there or you came home, you went on <coughs> regular, <coughs> excuse me, you went on regular airlines. And then did you land somewhere near uh, Saigon, Tonsonu? Uh, I think we landed, if I remember, we landed, you landed in Long Bend, and then they have what they call a replacement depot. You go, you stay there for like just a few days, and then they tell you where you're going you're gonna to be assigned in the country. So when you get off the plane in South Vietnam, what's your first sensation? Well, the first thing I <coughs> remember was kind of warm. Kind of warm. It was vicarious, you know, it was tropical climate. It was, it was in September. It was still pretty warm there. The thing I always remember, we were waiting like in the airport, you know, and I went into like what they call the washroom or the latrine, and there was, a, there was signs by the the water of the taps, the faucets, and it said, this water is not non-potable. So when I came back, I sat next to this friend of mine that was with me, and I says, what does it mean? There was a sign on all these uh, faucets or faucets in the uh, latrine that said non-potable. And all of a sudden, there was a guy that had been in Vietnam, a soldier that had been over there, and he says, I'll tell you what that means. He says, that means you can't drink it. It's not, it's not, don't drink the water. That water, that has to be treated. You're taking a risk if you drink the water. He says, you have to be very careful with the water over here. So that's one of the first things I remember. And another thing I remember, when they put us on these buses to take us to these barracks, like I said, it was very hot, kind of humid, and we were on the buses, and they had screens on the buses, 
and one of the guys was trying to open, uh, one of the soldiers was trying to open the window, and he was pushing on the screen, and the bus driver, the guy who was in the service, said, uh, don't do that. Don't move that screen. He said, you know why those screens are on there? So in case somebody tries to throw in a grenade in the bus. So when I heard that, I said, oh, you know, you're going to have to be careful. Over and when you go by, say, buildings, they have sandbags. It's kind of, you know, they have a guard in the front. So you know you're in a combat area, combat zone. So um, you're in the replacement depot at this time? Yeah. And then do you know what division, what uh, division, brigade or division you're going to? Yeah, they, they come and they tell you, you know, as a matter of fact, because there was a, when I went over, it was a big group of medics. What they did is they, my name was Carr, so they started at the bottom of the country, I guess A to D. We got sent there, and then if you were, you know, E to H or something, you got sent higher up. So they, and I got, I was down in the, uh, like in the Delta area, south of the country, and I was sent to the, what they call the 9th Division. I was in the 3rd third, third Brigade of the 9th Division. So then they, you know, they have a truck that takes you out. And you go to, uh, well, they, they had, uh, like the base I was in, you report there's a doctor that's actually in charge there. And then they just tell you, you're going to be assigned to, uh, I was with, with an infantry uh, outfit for company for about like four and a half months. So that, um, that company, they're, they're at a regular base? Yeah. So are you sleeping in a barracks at night? Right. Then, or well, sometimes you're out in the field. You would, we, had a bar we had a base, and there was a barracks that, you know, we stayed in. But then there would be, we would go out in the field. They would go on patrols, or you'd stay out overnight. The only thing is, because like I said, it was the Delta, and it's very wet down there. Of course, it was humid, and it rained a lot. So they would rotate us in. Like, we would, most of the time, we would stay out maybe three or four days, and then they would have us go back in and try to, like, kind of clean up, you know, air out. One of the big problems over there, because I was a, one of the things when I was a medic, a lot of the guys got skin disease. They had ringworm was a big problem, and you know you have to. It was hard. We didn't have like the showers we had there. They did have showers, but they didn't have like you know indoor plumbing. We didn't have hot water, so it was kind of hard to keep real clean in that. So it was it was kind of rough being out with the infantry. I'm sorry, those guys were out there for the whole year, most of them. So they, they had, a, and I, like I said, I consider myself lucky it was a medic because uh, usually the, the medics would be assigned in the, like, a, you'd be a field medic for, you're supposed to be like for six months, and then you worked in what they call a clearing station, or you, you worked someplace else, and, you, you know, then you were just stayed in the base all the time, basically. But uh, I was there for four and a half months. They got a replacement, so I was taken out. I was rotated out. To where we rotated to there? I was, there was a big base, not a real big base, but it was called Tan Am. It was in the area where we had been in operation. And then there, it's just kind of like, you know, I worked on the night shift. They had, the way the casualties came in, they had, they came in on a helicopter, what they call the medevac. And like, I worked at night, you'd get a phone call from the tower and they'd say, oh, you know, they're bringing some casualties in. There'd be a doctor that would be on call at night. We'd have to go wake them up. So, you know, and where they'd give you duties to, like, like that's what I was doing that one day. They gave us extra, sometimes we had to do extra things, like we were uh, putting this cement basketball court in. They, they told us, all right, you know, work on that for a while. Be useful, yeah. 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 So, um, so you're on duty, so when you're at the base, you're on duty like from 9 to 5 or... Well, they, I worked in the, the, like at night, the evening in the, shift, yeah. yeah they had like, so there was always somebody there and then, you know, there was like, like I said, there was, we had doctors that were assigned there and <coughs> there would be one doctor like it, they to rotate it. If they call in, if there was casualties coming in, they'd say, you know, it's serious, get the doctor, you know, get set up for whatever you need. So we'd, somebody would go wake the doctor up, he'd come over. Um, I remember they had that television series, MASH. Yeah. Was it was kind of something like that. Oh, was it? Similar. Well, it was, I'll give you an example, though. I talked to the, my doctor, a family doctor, when I came home in Lyons, and I was explaining. I said, yeah, well, they, 
they had all the casualties come in, even if like somebody had, uh, you know, passed out in the heat or whatever, they brought him in by helicopter. He said, when you see the movie MASH or the TV show, only the serious ones came in by helicopter, and they could only fly during the day. They didn't have all the radios and stuff. He says, oh, I was telling him, I said, oh, yeah, they, they had radios on them, and, uh, you know, and it, it, if somebody got, even if, like, somebody got sick in the field, they could just call a helicopter and they could take them out. Did you ever get sick there? While you were over? Uh, nothing real serious. I mean, you know, sometimes I believe you'd maybe get like a sore throat or something, and you just go to the doctor, and they, you know, they tell you. I'd st stay where they had a area where some of the soldiers were sick or slightly wounded, so I just stayed in bed for a few days, and then. So uh, you never, you never came down with malaria or anything. No, you, there was there was a big problem over there. You they, you had to take pills. They made sure that was one of the things I did as a medic. They had. The guys, they hit, in our area, there was, I remember that, they had to take a big orange pill once a week, and the doctor said, make sure that everybody takes that. It doesn't, it doesn't prevent malaria, but what it does, I don't know what, uh, what it was, what, the, what was in the pill, but if you take it and you get malaria, then you respond to treatment better. And if they, occasionally we got guys in that had malaria, and I remember one time a guy came in, one of the American soldiers came in and he had malaria, and his temperature, Neil, was so high, it was off the end of the thermometer. And they put him in a, like a tub and they put ice in there. And I mean, I mean, yeah, if you got that, that was pretty serious. Did he survive okay? Or? Yeah, from what I heard. I guess they got his temperature down. So, um, was there one, um, as a medic, was there one procedure you did more than any other ones or? No, basically just making sure everybody kind of, you know, like if they had skin disease, like the big thing was like uh, ringworm, there was like a, this tenactin was a lotion you put on. I mean, <coughs> you know, just kind of making sure like if somebody had to get a shot or something, you know, or you go tell the doctor or somebody. One of the things was there was some guys, they of course, you know, was kind of stressful and you're away from home and they, there were a few guys that wanted to get out of the service. So they had like, you know, we're having what they claim they had psychological problems. So what I used to do was I used to volunteer to take them in the Saigon. They had a big, huge hospital, their third field. So I would take them to the hospital to see, you know, and they, they would talk to, they, they talk to the psychiatrist. I remember one, the one I remember in particular, there was this a farm young kid, young guy. He was from Georgia. And I don't want to, I'm not making fun of him, but this guy, I don't know how he made it in the service. He was really, you know, you could just see that. I don't know how he even made it that far. He made it over to Vietnam. And he, you know, kind of really slow. And he went out in the field with the infantry. And the guys were telling me, they said, this guy is He's crazy. He doesn't pay attention. They, you know, they said he's either going to kill himself or kill somebody else. He's he's a danger. It got so bad. One guy threatened to kill him if he didn't start listening. So finally, they said, "All right, take him to the psychiatrist." So I took him to the psychiatrist, and when the psychiatrist talked to him, he came right out and says, "Who brought this man up here?" <laughs> and I said, "I did, sir." He goes, "He shouldn't be over here. He shouldn't be near." And I said, I know that, sir. I says, what is his problem? And he looked at me and he goes, he's dumb. He's just plain dumb. He says, we're going to send him home. And I said, well, we know. He says, we're getting what they call a general discharge. We're just going to out of the service. So when we were going back to the base, his name was Gay. That was his name, his last name. So I said, Gay, what did you tell the psychiatrist? They went in there and only talked to him for, I'd say, a minute. And I says, well, what happened? He says, well, when he went in to talk to him, when you landed in Vietnam, you were, you were guaranteed to go home exactly one year from the day you landed. And everybody knew when they landed. Like you said, when did I land? I think it was September 10th, 1969. I knew I was guaranteed to go home uh, September 10th, 1970. So when I said, what did you say to the psychiatrist? And he said he was looking, he said, he was looking at the papers. And he said, uh, Private Gay, when did you land in Vietnam? He goes, 
I don't rightly recall. I think it was back there in September, October. He goes, you don't know when you landed in Vietnam? He goes, well, I don't exactly remember. And when he heard that, he says, all right, send this guy home. So but Gay really was uh, a little the, slow. He, oh, he this guy, I don't know. To be honest, I don't know how he made it in the service, how he got that far. Yeah. And they used to have, I don't know if you ever heard of this, they did have a program one time when uh, Robert McNamara was Secretary of Defense. Did you ever hear of the 100,000 project? No. Okay. They started it in the late 60s. They let in men, if you ever check into this, that 100,000 project, I think the name of it was, they let in men that had lower scores that they normally wouldn't let in, and they brought them and let them come into the service. They figured they'd get some training or, you know, would help them, you know, when they got out, they'd get benefits. So he probably got in under some program like that. And like I said, like, but some of these guys, a lot of these guys, they just were kind of nervous being over there or, you know, they were kind of, it was hard for them to be separated from their families. But like this guy, as soon as the psychiatrist talked to him, he, right away, he says, all right, we're sending a bit of corn. Yeah. Anyway. You know, I'm just thinking about the medics. Um, in terms of personality, it would be better if you were kind of a kind, sympathetic person if you were a medic. Well, some of the medics, okay, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Not, I wasn't one. Some were what they call conscientious objectors. They would not carry weapons. Now, let's say in our outfit, if you had like 50 medics, maybe like five or six would be CEOs. And if you, if you, you know, the guys, they asked me, and they said, are you a CEO? And I said, no, no, I carried my, I had an M16. But they said, no, don't worry about it. You know, we're just keep an eye out on us. They didn't expect you to, I didn't have to carry any machine gun bullets or uh, grenades. You know, if you didn't want to, they said, you're, you're the medic. Don't worry about fighting. You know, just take care of us. So, and it was, I never heard anybody make any comment about anybody that was a CEO. If they were over there and they were willing to be in the service, it was So fine. you never had to fire a gun in defense over there? Well, you, you carry it around. I mean, sometimes yeah. they say you like, just kind of like send warning shots mm -hmm. out. I mean, I never... When you were out in the field... Yeah, I carried... I had a rifle at NM-16. Were there any casualties at yeah. that time? Yes. We had guys that were killed. Was that rifle fire, Claymore Mines? Or well, we had one time they found some guys in a bunker and we went in, it was booby-trapped, and the booby trap went off. Uh, one soldier was killed, and uh, two guys were wounded really bad. And that was, that was what a lot of the casualties were. And then after I was getting ready to be taken out of the field, I was actually waiting to get out of the field, and there was some guys uh, in our, my right that I lived with in the barracks, they, hit, they caught a guy in a, a bunker, and he started firing back, he killed two of the guys that I knew. So there was one guy, this one guy, I mean, never forget his name. His name was uh, Bob Willett, Robert Willett. He was from Springfield. He was from uh, Illinois. W-I? I don't know what it was. It was W-I-I-L-E-T, -I, I think. Oh, he, really? was, yeah. he, was he was married. He was from Springfield. But the, the other guy, I didn't really know him that well. I think his last name was Harrison. He was from, like, Tennessee. I, I think he just came in. Yeah. But the other guy I had known pretty well. Yeah. So we had, we had, you know, we had, when I was there, the fighting had, on our area, the fighting had died down a lot. The only time there was a big increase in uh, fighting, and it was only for a month, is when they had, they went into Cambodia. But by that time, I was out of the field. But a lot of the guys that I had been with before, they were in Cambodia. So you were in the field for a few months? Four and a half months. Four and a half months. And up when you're in the field, you're sleeping out there in the yep. field. So you're in, you're, are you in tents or no? No. You're just on the ground. You might go in a house. You might yeah. go on just the Vietnamese people there. You just go and say, well, can we stay in the hut? Come in and these armed guys come in there. They're not going to. They had big bunkers that they slept in. They had like this inside their house. They put like built a big like bunker, I don't know if you might call it a bunker, but they had like a mud thing and they, they went in there at night, they took a, a honey pot in there and they stayed in there at night and then they came out during the day. Yeah. So, yeah. The honey pot is a... Uh, well, you go to the washroom, so because they, yeah. they wouldn't go outside at night. If they were walking around, they could get shot. So they, they would, they, at night, they would just stay in their, their yeah. huts. You get your water from the wells in the village? Or well, something? they had big pot. They, no, in Vietnam, they had these huge jars 
they, they kept the rainwater, and it was clear, you know, it was a huge shot. If you wanted water, just say nook is how you say water in Vietnamese. You just go over and put your canteen in there, and it was cool water, good water. So they you water. didn't see rations out in the field? Yeah, you, yeah. you could bring, you, they had food, or sometimes if they were, uh, they would even, like with the helicopters, they would bring it once in a while, they'd bring hot meals out to you. They'd set up a kitchen out, out in the field, and you'd, you'd eat out there. And then, of course, we had a, there was a, a mess hall in the base. When you got back, you could go eat. And you got back to the base? Yeah. They, they, they'd say, right, That was after the four months or at various times? In, no, no. You, when, you were, you, when you would get back and the, like, clean up, yeah, you'd, you'd be in the in. barracks, and then you could just go down. They had mess call, and you'd go down for, like, lunch or dinner or breakfast or whatever. Then you'd go back in the field then. Right. So you'd recharge at the... Right, yeah, right. You'd be yeah. staying for a few days, and then they you know, tell you to go out again. Did you lose weight while you were there? Or? I think, well, I was always pretty thin. I, yeah, I mean, I didn't, uh, I mean, if you see in the picture there, I, mean, I was never really that heavy. Yeah. How did you uh, stay in touch with your family? Well, we just wrote. It, you could, if you went to Saigon, they had like, uh, like this real big hospital. There were people, I remember we went in this, I used to go in the library, and they had like some guys could like call home or... They had, one thing is they had those ham radio operators. Some of them volunteered. You could call, like, they would call in Vietnam. They would call to some guy in, like, Alaska or someplace, and he would call up, the, it's, you know, you give him your phone number, your family's number in, like, Chicago or New York, and they would call him on the phone. So, but it was kind of like they, they had to switch back and forth. It, but the phone, from, the, from what I understand, the phone lines in Saigon were pretty good. Yeah, but I, I never I never called when I was over. Yeah. It was kind of hard to stay in touch. So, um, did you feel more pressure, more stress when you're out in the field oh, as definitely. opposed to being in yeah. on the base? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's because you know, you're you never know. I mean, cause like I said, I wasn't really in a lot of fighting or anything. But I mean, when you're out in the field, you you, you really have to be careful. The main thing we were kind of worried about was like booby traps and things like that. That's where a lot of the so is that a platoon size group that you're with? Yeah, well, you're in a company and a you're company. like and you're you're, you're the for the uh, medic for the platoon, and then you, you go out and like and the know, platoon is about fifteen twenty. Let's say it's probably about twenty five to thirty guys. Twenty five to thirty guys. Mm -hmm. um, back in the states, here, you'd see sometimes the entertainers would be at some bases or giving shows yeah. for the USO. Performances? Did you have any of that? Uh, they had some. Some came out. There were some once in a while. They they came. They had the one thing they did have. I don't know if you ever heard, did. You ever heard of donut dollies? Yeah. Yeah. They would come to the bases sometimes, like around Christmas or, you know, they were just young girls. They had like one time when I was, uh, Bob Hope was there for Christmas, and. When he goes there, he goes all day. When they showed it on TV, they're only showing clips. There's like a show that he puts on in each base, so they asked if some guys wanted to go see it. So they they hit a truck. Usually, what they from what I understand, they try to get the guys that are wounded or the ones like they have the nurses and they, if you see like in the, if you ever see like the reruns or they have it on, on the internet, like the guys up in the front, a lot of them were guys that were wounded and stuff. So they would they would go to the big bases where they hit the big hospitals. Yeah, they did have, they tried to have entertainment over there, but I mean, you know, and, and they did have, like, uh, for the Americans, they had their own TV network for the military, and like, say, the ones they gave, they had, like, a girl, a, what they call a whack, a woman's army corps, she gave the weather, and all the guys they were giving the news were guys in the, in the army. They had uniforms on or the Air Force. As a matter of fact, there was a big scandal one time when I first went over there. One of the guys that was giving the news, after he gave his report, he says, and I want you to know that the news is censored over here. So after that, he wasn't on the news anymore. <laughs> wow. No, that happened. That was, and so this was like a, a TV studio inside. Yeah, he was, he was on t live TV, yeah. and he came right at the end of his report. I forget yeah. what his name was. I don't yeah. know if it's on the Internet. Yeah. But right at the end of the report, and he goes, and I want you to know, all the news you're seeing over here is censored. And then they had a guy, another guy followed, and he was 
giving the sports, and he goes, whatever his name is, like Bob Jones, he goes, well, thanks. He says, thanks, Bob Jones, in more ways than one. And he wasn't on it there anymore either. So people were saying, yeah. yeah. They, the news over there, like I said, was all controlled by the military. So, But you could get newspapers and stuff, magazines. They didn't censor any of that. So um, did you, um, w were you allowed any leave or R&R? &R? Yeah, I went to, I took a leave to, uh, where did I go? I went to Bangkok for a week one time, and then I went to ta Taipei and Taiwan just to kind of, you know, get away. And it was, they, you know, it was the tourist things, you know, like in Bangkok they had a lot of these temples and stuff. Bangkok's got a wild uh, reputation even now. I don't know if you know where it goes there. Yeah. It's kind of a, after that, well, they had, there was a lot of Air Force that were, they had, I guess it was 50,000 Air Force in uh, Thailand. There was a lot of Americans over there. And I was going to just say, one of the sergeants I had, I mean, he was a medic, they had a lot more training. He had been assigned in Thai, Thailand before he came to Vietnam. And he was saying when he was there, he didn't wear his uniform. They, called, they didn't go by sergeant. They went by just like, you know, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, he had to have a passport. But he was, a, he was assigned in Thailand. And I think what he was doing, they were going around, well, they used to have what they call med camps. They would give, like, medical help to villages. And I think what they were using them for was going around just, like, getting intelligence in it. So they would, they would use the military to kind of find out what was going on. But he said, yeah, when he was there, he says that they never called him by his rank. It was kind of like, yeah, I mean, he was still in the service, but it was almost like he was a civilian. And that was in Thailand. In Thailand. Thailand. There were a lot of, there were a lot, like I said, the Air Force. There were a lot of, there was like about 50,000 Air Force. And the Thais, they, you know, there, there wasn't any war on. They liked Americans. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the Thai girls were very pretty, by the way. A lot, uh, there was a lot of the soldiers uh, or the guys in the Air Force married Thai women. They're, you know, even now, they're like, you know, they're, there's like a, people go there if you want to have a good time or something. Yeah, like, it seems they, like it attracts all kinds of people. Yeah, yeah. They have, well, it's, you know, kind of like Las Vegas or something. You know, yeah. people go out there just to kind of spend a lot of money and have a good yeah. time. So do you recall any particularly uh, humorous or unusual events? No, just sometimes like, well, I'll give you something like we had when I worked in this one base. Uh, we had, there was like some, some of the, we had Vietnamese that worked on. One woman was kind of like, kind of like an interpreter and she would help out with some of the medical things. And she was telling me one time, she said to, uh, she, this, she asked, like you say, if you go on an R&R &R on a leave, she asked this one guy if he was going to go on leave. And she told me, she says, oh, he told me he was injured. And I said, he was injured. And I says, why do you, why do you say that? Why do you think that? He go, she goes, I asked him if he was going on R&R. &R. He says, I can't go. I'm broken. And I says, well, he meant he was broke. He didn't have any money. <laughs> I, I says, it, it doesn't mean he was injured or just yeah. like he had a broken arm. Yeah. He was broke. That means, that means you know, you don't, I don't have the money to go on leave. So they would sometimes, you know, hear Americans talk or yeah. something, and they, so you know. The, the leave wasn't all expenses paid. You had to. No, you, you, well, if you had enough money, you could go and check. You could get, like, your, if you had money saved, because you saved money over. You didn't really have a lot to spend it on. So <coughs> what you would do is go to finance, and you would, you know, take money out, and you would go there, and, you know, you just, like I said, people want to have a good time. A lot of times guys just wanted to drink and uh, yeah. chase women or whatever yeah. it was. But Did you, um, so when you're, when you're in uh, Taiwan and in yeah. Thailand, did you s sample any new food or did you really enjoy No, they, well, they had like the Thai food or something. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, they <coughs> the thing I remember was <coughs> I went to a movie and they had them all American movies, and they had it, it was in English, and they had it subtitled. So if you wanted to go, like I said, I think I saw Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid over there. Wow. You know? And I remember one thing is they told us, they gave a briefing before you went in there, and they said, if you go in a movie, they say that before the movie starts, or maybe when, I think it was when it started or ended, they're going to show the king, uh, Thailand, and you have to stand up. 
And then they said, don't try to leave the theater because they locked the doors. And they said, but you, and they warned us, they said, you know, you have to be very respectful. You know, your visitors here, you know, uh, don't pat the kids on the head or anything that's, I don't know, that's bad luck or something. They said, you know, just, but the Thais were very friendly to the Americans. I think the Thailand and, uh, and they were, they were, like I said, there wasn't a war on and they liked the tourists and that, so. Is there anything that stands out in your memory overall? Uh, there's one thing, I'm one incident I remember, and the reason why I bring this up, like I said, I used to go to this real big hospital in Saigon, and I was in there one time, <coughs> and there was an American lieutenant and myself. We were, it was an older Vietnamese woman, and she was talking to me, and she was talking to us, and she mentioned this thing, because like I said, the French had been over there, most people don't remember, you know, they had been involved there for a long time and they had been fighting. And she made a comment to me that I never forgot. She said, oh, you Americans and the French, you're very much alike. And she even said, you're going you're gonna to leave the country. You're going to eventually leave. But she said, the difference between you and the French is when they left, they took their babies with them. And you, you, the Americans don't. So the lieutenant thought she was trying to be funny, and he started laughing. This woman was serious. Neil, if a French soldier had a child with a Vietnamese woman, even if it was they weren't married, if it was maybe illegitimate or not, they weren't legally married, the child was considered a French citizen. If a Vietnamese woman had a child with an American soldier, they didn't, I mean, I think they did eventually bring some over. But that, I think that was what she was saying is like, it's kind of like, you know, the French, when they, when they were here, when they, something happened, they took care of the ones, the children that were here. The Americans just kind of forgot about them, just didn't want to deal with that. Um, Mr. Carr, you attained the rank of an E4, a specialist four. Right. Is that a sergeant? Uh, no, no. It, it, sergeant would be, okay. Sergeant is like the lowest rank is an E1 when you first go in, and then you're like uh, E, I think what is it, E2 is that you got one stripe, E3 is private first class, E4 is that you're a specialist. If you're a sergeant, you're an E5, or if you're a specialist, 5. But usually to become like an E5, you probably have to be in at least two years. Yeah. So, so I was only in a year and a half. So I don't even know if this is helpful, but. Is this like the equivalent of a corporal or? Yeah, they, corporal, you, usually corporal, you don't really see, it. when I was in, you don't really see that. I don't know if they have that now. They don't, because like, if you look on my uniform there, uh -huh. that's what that is, that patch there. Now, if it has a stripe above it, then it means you're an E5, uh, or a specialist 5. So you did, get, you, you did get a promotion though. Oh right? yeah, no, you get promoted when you're, once you, if you've been in, like when you go in, like say you're a recruit, you're E1, that's the starting out, then you get like one stripe, that's E2, a private first class is E3, and then you're a uh, uh, specialist, when you're a specialist, you're E4, and then you can get like another stripe, you're an E5. That, when you're like that, then you're, yeah, you're, you're like equivalent to a sergeant. But yeah. usually, they, but they will take a couple of years to probably get. So, um, as your time in Vietnam is, is coming to an end, there's, you don't have any, you don't, you're not inclined to, to uh, extend your, your service. I did stay for one month extra. Okay, the reason why is, like I said, when I, at that time, they were cutting back, they were doing what they call the withdrawals. They were cutting back the service. So, if you came back from Vietnam and you had less than six months of active service left, you could put in what they call an early discharge. So when I says, well, now I got my benefits, um, you know, I can go to school, you know, they have the GI Bill uh, in Illinois, they had the Illinois State Scholarship. So I said, well, this would be my chance to go back to school. So I just said, well, I'll stay an extra month. I didn't come back to October instead of September. And then when I came home, I got this when I got my discharge. And then at that time, there were so many guys leaving the service they put you in a reserve unit, but, you know, they never, I never had to go to any, I never went to any meetings or anything. You never thought of making a career of the Army? No, no, I didn't want to. And then, having been a medic, um, 
you didn't think I'm going to go into the health services or, uh, or something? Or I don't know. I mean, I, it, there was, yeah, we did get training in that, but like I said, I thought they kind of rushed us through. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, if somebody had stayed in like for like, you know, like two or three years or they'd worked, you know, got worked in an emergency room or something like that, yeah, some of the some of the guys did get you know if you had stayed in or been so in for a while. It sounds like when you say they were cutting back on the number, it, it sounds like they were drawing troops down at that time. Yeah, they were. That was there was when Nixon came in. Yeah, they started. As a matter of fact, the unit, the first unit that he pulled out, I think that was uh, August 1969. That was the outfit I was in. He pulled most of the Ninth Division out. There was only like part of it that was left. And that's where I was assigned. And some of the guys had been almost, I guess if they had like seven or eight months, they could have gone home early. But if they had less, they had to still stay the rest of the tour. So some of the guys, they, they almost were able to go home, but they hadn't been there long yeah. enough. So this area where the 9th Division was, and they're being drawn down, yeah. are they being replaced by anybody else? Well, the Viet South Vietnamese were supposed to take the fighting over. Like they had, and I didn't, never went to it. They had a real big base that a lot of the guys used to talk about. It was called Dong Tam. It was like further south. And they said that they had turned the base over to them. So they had built a huge base there. And when they withdrew most of the 9th Division, they turned it over to the Viet, uh, South Vietnamese so, government. So I wonder if any of you guys, if you had any thoughts about what might happen if the, if the American forces were drawn down. Well, that was the thing that they said uh, that Nixon, his big uh, strategy was Vietnamization. He was going to have the South Vietnamese, they were going to take over the uh, blunt of the fighting. They were going to do the, most of the fighting. He would give them support. They would, you know, they had the Air Force there. And that was it. They would give them more equipment, more training. Uh, eventually, I mean, I don't know if you have to tell you what happened. Eventually, when all the American troops left, uh, they weren't able to hold off the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, and they eventually won. Were you surprised to hear that or to learn that? or? Well, I was very upsetting because uh, you figure we, all these guys got killed over there, all the effort, and, uh, you know, but I think people just figured, well, you know, they didn't want to, how long were we going to stay in there? I mean, by that time Ford was president, he just announced, you know, we spent all this money, we, you know, we had given them equipment, if they, if they couldn't hold off, it's just the other side, I don't know, I guess the, they were just determined to win. I felt sorry for the ones that had supported the Americans, and I think there was even after they took over, there was a lot that tried to, you know, fled or escaped. I feel sorry for, like, the Vietnamese that were on, you know, helped the Americans, but because I know there was repercussions against that. Or, like I said, these ones that, if they had their father, if they were fathered by an American soldier, I'm, I've heard that, uh, you know, they're kind of looked down on, they're not accepted. So we've, I've talked to some of the, the veterans that have gone back over there, the ones we meet on uh, with the coffee, and they say, well, they say the younger people now, you know, they've forgotten about the war. The ones that are living there now, the young people, they don't have any memories of it. So they, say there's, they don't think there's any strong hostility against the Americans or the United States. But so, do you remember the day that your service in the army ended? Oh yeah, it was October tenth, nineteen seventy. That was it when I came home, and then I yeah. got my papers, flew home, and it so was did you fly out of that area? Oakland, Oakland. We landed in Oakland, and then and I was, was it on a commercial carrier then right. too? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I just went back to Chicago, and I was home. I was out. And did you have any difficulty adjusting to life in the I don't think life? so. I don't. My wife claims sometimes some, some, she doesn't like to, the. The only thing is the. Did I your never wife met, know you at that time? Pardon? Did your wife know you? At no, that no, time? no, no, no. We got into marriage yeah. years later. But I was saying, the thing I kind of remember was people didn't really want to hear about it. I don't. I never detected anybody uh, criticized me you know, personally, or if I, if I told them I was in the service, especially if I said, well, I was a medic, they go, well, you weren't killing people, you weren't fighting, you weren't a, I was a soldier, but I said, no, I, 
when I was in, I went to university. I went to Northern. I got a teaching degree. Was that using the GI yeah. benefits? Yeah, and yeah. I remember my roommate, the guy. He was very much against the, you know, being in the military. He said he never would have went in if they drafted him. He didn't have to go in. And I said, well, it's the choice you would have had to make. He says he would, he would have refused to go in the service altogether. But, and if somebody didn't want to go in or they avoided the service, well, that's the decision they made. I don't. Uh, if they thought that was the right thing to do, you know, they, they have to decide what they thought was right. Did um, did you stay in contact with any of your war When I first buddies? came home, there was one guy that he was from Milwaukee and he moved down to Chicago in an apartment in, uh, in the Gold Coast, so I used to go see him. But it wasn't until I started meeting the veterans now, like for the, where we, we met him over at the Dunkin' Donuts or in Martin Grove. But, and like my brother, He's not interested in any of that either. He never really talks about the American Legion or VFW. No, or no, we're no. never involved. We did do an interview. There was a, a young girl that uh, he was a Mount Prospect. This girl was doing a project for her high school, so she interviewed him and she interviewed me, and then they published it in a book. But the only thing is, when I saw what they published. They had some of the things they kind of, con I think they confused my brother and myself. They said, like, he was drafted. Well, he wasn't. He enlisted, you know. So, and they, 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 they said, like, this other thing. They said, we grew up in Chicago. Actually, we grew up in the suburbs, you know. So, I, I mean, it wasn't anything really. It was, I don't know, maybe somebody else re wrote it up for her or something. They kind of. They, they, some of the things weren't really completely accurate, but that was. Uh, so there were no, and there were no reunions that you attended. No, no, I haven't done any of those. Well, I, um, I sense we're coming to the end of the interview. Okay. Um, and there's always two questions that we ask, as recommended by the Library of Congress. Um, uh, how do you think your service and experiences affected your life? I think it was, in a way, I think it was the. Very, you learned a lot. You get a chance to go see another country, another culture. You, it, it, you would meet all different kinds of people. I think you appreciate, well, like in our country, you appreciate what you have. You know, you, you realize what it, what's the benefits, like why do people want to come to the United States? What do we have? What opportunities that we have? And I think there's one thing when I said, when I got out, I said, well, now I have a chance. I'm going to go back to school or see if I can finish my education, and, and that's what I did. So, in a way, and plus, like I said, I got the, the GI Bill. There was an Illinois State Scholarship. They paid for most of my education, and there, you know, there are benefits from being a veteran. So, I, I, you know, I can't complain. I mean, I was, I was in a year and a half. They paid for, uh, I got four years of schooling. So, I think... For me, it was beneficial. I, I, I can say, yeah, there's some things uh, you know, you know, that I think about. There were some sad things or you know, tragic things that happened. But uh, compared to what other people had to deal with, I, I can't really say. I think you know, very like my brother. He was over there for a year or two. He wasn't. Uh, neither one of us was wounded. You know, we had friends. They were unfortunately they were in the service. that died. Or guys we were in the service with, but uh, no, I, I think in a way, I think it, I learned a lot, and I think, uh, you know, now when I'm older now, I can look back on it. I feel sorry for the guys in the service now. I mean, I, you know, if they're in danger or their families, you know, when you, it's upsetting when you hear these young guys get killed in wherever it is, Afghanistan or Iraq. But, and I, I think now that the ones in the service, I think they're treated a lot better. I think people. People appreciate uh, what they're doing, and it's hard on their families. And when they're away, my wife and I were just our, our family. We were coming back from Ireland. There was a young woman that was on on the plane, and uh, her husband's uh, in the army now. He's in Poland, and she went over. They were he got leave, and they were traveling in Ireland, and uh, she got a chance to see him. But now she was coming back by herself. She's going back down to Texas again. And he's still overseas. Yeah. He's still over yeah. in Poland. As you were speaking, I was thinking, um, as a medic, did you see any early indications of the Agent Orange? No. You know, that was the thing is, that's one reason why I'm glad I got involved with these veterans. I, I, my own opinion, I don't think I, I always thought I was never affected by it. I, they didn't 
as far as I knew, they didn't. I never saw them spray it in the Delta in our area. I I don't think I was affected by it. Now I talked. I don't know if you know Roger McGill. He's the one that's in charge of the for our chapter, and he said you were affected by it. Everybody over there. He says you have it in your system now. Maybe some people, you know, obviously have serious health problems. When I was in training as a medic, when I was over there, I never heard any talk about that. There was one of the when we had the thing at the Heritage Center. Uh, one of the nurses said she was a nurse in Vietnam. Same thing. Never there was never any talk about what this uh, the oxide or this ancient orange did, and it wasn't until years later that it came out. And I think, and it's definitely there is, now they're saying it's even affecting some of the, not only the veterans, but their children and the grandchildren. So that has been a really sad legacy. So when you got assigned to your area of the country on the basis of the alphabet, yeah. you were in the south. If you had right. been further along in the alphabet, maybe you would have been assigned to another geographic band where yeah. perhaps there was more agency. Well, there, yeah. no, a lot of places they did use it, like in the jungle. They sprayed it, or guys even got it sprayed. I'll give you a perfect example. When it, some of the veterans were showing us, okay, I know you probably know the reason why it, it, it's colorless, but it was in big barrels and it had an orange stripe on it. The guys were showing us pictures when I met with the veterans. They had these 55 gallon drums. When they were done, we, after they used it, they cut them in half and they were cooking in it. And they didn't know that. I mean, they thought, okay, yeah, and they were barbecuing and cooking in it, and they were eating the food that was in there. Now, I see, I never, in our area, I never saw that. I didn't remember anybody ever doing that, but, right, I mean, there was another thing. I don't know why they didn't realize how, t I heard they, they were using it in the States, but it wasn't as toxic or something. There was a lot of, and now, they, they not only use it in Vietnam, they use it in Thailand, they use it in the Philippines, they use it in, by the DMZ in Korea. <laughs> there were military bases. He was a, somebody was saying there's a town in Missouri. It's completely abandoned now because they, they, they were doing something with Agent Orange there. And then uh, one of the final questions here is um, recommended to us to consider. Um, uh, how do you think your military experience influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, one thing is, like I say, it's easy. Here's the way I look at it. It's easy to get into a war. It's hard to get out. Like now, I mean, North Korea, Iran. I mean, yeah, these countries are causing trouble or they're dangerous. But if we start a war, once you start it, how do you get out of it? And that was the trouble in Vietnam. Once we got in, how did we get out? I mean, our people can talk about Nixon or he should have ended the war earlier. I. And I was a member, we talked about that when I was there. I remember one of the, and it was a, when it was a black GI that said this, we were talking about, well, like Nixon, why doesn't he end the war, and what's he doing? And <clears throat> this one black guy made a comment that I never forget. He said, well, he's the only one that's had ever been pulling troops out. He started getting the troops out. Now, he did get the troops out. He got the prisoners home. People said maybe he should have done it earlier. It was a bad agreement. He got us out. That was the bottom line. Now, once, it, once the Americans were out, the thing didn't last very long. The government collapsed there. People say it was a big mistake. It was a failure. All right. I always, like, I was watched that program, uh, what's his, uh, the one they hit on Vietnam. Ken Burns. Ken Burns. And it was actually a North Vietnamese lieutenant, I think, that made the comment. He said, when there's a war on, when there's a war, no one is a winner. And it's, I think that's a very precise comment, very concise comment. Nobody wins. You can say, well, they would the, the military victories, but the people suffer. It's just terrible. And you know, when there's a war on, like I say, there's a, it affects everybody. It affects the whole country, and there's been some people more than others. But I mean, like some, there's some guys that are never going to get over what happened over there. I, I consider myself lucky. I came back. I think I made a pretty good adjustment. I don't think I have any problems. Yeah. Right. Mr. Carr, did you become a history teacher then with your... Well, I, when I first came home, that was my major. And it wasn't a very good uh, major to be in. I worked as a substitute teacher in the suburbs. So I was taking Spanish in night school. So 
when I, I figured, well, Chicago always needed teachers. So when I went in, actually my background was secondary high school. So when I went in and they found out I took Spanish, they said, well, go to elementary school. You'll get picked up right away. So that's what happened. I started working with young children in elementary school. That's where I met my wife. So I worked almost 25 years in the Chicago Public School, and I always worked with Hispanic kids. Yes, were you on the Pilsen or? Pardon? Were you in Pilsen or? Yeah, I started out in Pilsen. It's around 18th Street. And then uh, my wife, I worked at, uh, near 26th in California or 26th Street. I worked over there for like 20 years. So I worked. And I, the kids I worked with, I always worked with young children. Yeah. The school I worked in, it was a pub regular, it was a public school, but it was kind of a special school. It was only from uh, preschool to third grade. So I always worked with young children. And I was bigger than they were anyway. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Carr, do you think there's anything we haven't covered or that you'd no, like to fine. add to the I don't know if you want to ask me anything else or if you're curious. No, I, I think it was, I hope you enjoyed it. I did. I, I, I learned, uh, I've got a wonderful uh, opportunity w working with the veterans to learn. I was just curious, did you ever meet any or talk to anybody that was a uh, prisoner? Uh, I interviewed, not in Vietnam, I interviewed uh, a gentleman, Richard Regala, who was on the Pueblo. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that must and have been interesting. It was, and he donated his uniform to us, and then we oh. gave his uniform to the uh, Niles Historical Society, oh, and uh, yeah, they're still every year about this time they send more petitions to uh, to Washington or obtain signatures from congressmen because they want the United States to get the Pueblo ship back, yeah. and they want it to go back to Pueblo, Colorado. I don't remember when they had and when that was the the they used they use it as a kind of a tourist. And there was another thing. thing people remember just happened when I first went in the army. There was, I guess, a reconnaissance plane. There was some. I think so. I know there were some Marines and some soldiers on it. The North Koreans shot it down and they killed all the guys on it. And I hate, I, mean, I don't think I have any prejudice, but I know that the Koreans, even the Korean troops in Vietnam, they, well, maybe that's how they fight. They are very brutal. And I'll give you an example. I met this one guy. Uh, he was in the Army. He was in Vietnam. He was in payroll, so he wasn't in the field. And near the base where he was, he was fur they were further up north, he said the uh, South Korean, they call them the rock troops, they had their base there. He said they had a POW compound. He said all the time he was there for the whole year, Neil, there was only one prisoner they had there, and he didn't even survive. They didn't take any prisoners. They were very brutal. Very brutal. Yeah, I met a Vietnamese um, veteran who was a rock uh, guy. I think he was... Green Berets or some special mm -hmm. outfit, but he said the Viet Cong were afraid of them. They were well, like I said, they didn't take any prisoners. Very brutal. I mean, we you know they supported the Americans. I heard they fought really hard, but you know, like I said, they were very. I don't. But that's how they fight over there. A lot of people don't want to realize that. You know, I mean, I'm not saying Americans didn't. Unfortunately, there were bad things on the American side, but the Koreans, terrible. Terrible. And like this guy, this Kim Il Young or whatever his name is, I can't imagine. Like he killed his own half brother. I mean, that is, yeah. If you capture, any, you know, anybody they fight, or, and I don't know, like Trump, I don't know if he's, <laughs> I don't know if he, this is a little bit of trivia. I don't know if you ever heard this. My wife doesn't like me bring up. You know where Donald Trump's mother was born? Scotland. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Liberty Islands. Yeah. He owns two golf courses in Scotland. He owns one in Ireland, too, by the way. Yeah. That's the next one where my wife's thing is from. Yeah. Yeah, he's a piece of work, right? Were you a history teacher, major? No, no. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Carr, I want to thank oh, you for the enlightening you. interview. It's, it's All right. Well, you enjoyed it. Keep the yeah. pictures. If you want to make a copy of it, I don't know if you want to.